Thank you for that introduction. So um, actually, my first uh, touch point, so to speak, with the CFA was in Paris, where I'm, I live. And I'm originally from Los Angeles, but I, I'm Parisian because I call Paris my home for the last 12 years. Um, but I presented to the CFA uh, chapter there. And then uh, in January, I was in Geneva, and I had a presentation at the um, American International Association of Geneva, American, yeah, International Club of Geneva, and I met Philip Sundquist, I don't know if you know him, and so I spoke with him, and he said, oh, you know, maybe the, the chapters in Geneva and Zurich would be interested. So I, last week, I presented to your colleagues in Geneva, and this week I'm here. So thanks for the opportunity. So how many of you uh, received uh, the ebook? I, I sent you all the ebook. Okay, good. I don't know if you had time to peruse it, but uh, it'll make more sense after my presentation, and you can read it at your your leisure. But I'll be referring it to a lot, uh, referring to it a lot during my presentation, because you can use it as a, a resource, a, a tool to kind of jumpstart fusing a storytelling with your personal brand. And I also sent you a um, a quiz. We can do a little audit, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and so how many of you look, filled out the quiz? Right? OK. And uh, anyone want to share what their score was? <laughs> yeah. Did you all take it and think, oh, I really need to come to this presentation? <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here to uh, find out more how to get you know, your right, your uh, ranking up. But there was one con key question on there was um, in terms of Googling yourself. Did you all Google yourself and find out what pops up on the first page? How many are on LinkedIn, first of all? Okay. All right. And um, how many found that your LinkedIn profile, when you Googled yourself, was near the top. OK. That's usually what, for the rest of you, what popped up first when you were Googled? Well, there are, oh, there are some significant people with my same name, one who was a witness in a trial. Okay. <laughs> and so all those things are always towards the top. OK. And your LinkedIn profile, where did that pop up? Middle to bottom, that's in the middle of the first page. Okay. And how many of you just in general, when you're going to be meeting somebody, uh, Google them before meeting them? Right? I do that, I think, about 95% of the time. Just And usually uh, what pops up first for these people, if they're professionals, there's now, I think, 280 million professionals on LinkedIn. Uh, so usually their LinkedIn profile will pop up first, and since a lot of people are familiar with that LinkedIn landscape, you know, that's where they're going to go to find out about an individual. So if you're on LinkedIn, and maybe you know, with the quiz and everything, it was the first time you thought, aha, I should be Googling myself to see what other people are seeing. <laughs> and um, if it is your LinkedIn profile that shows up on the first page, then you should really pay attention to what's there. And I'll get into this a little deeper, but there's a great place on your LinkedIn profile to tell your story about the brand called you. Okay, well, let's, um, let's get started. So uh, we're going to be talking about using personal branding and storytelling. And there's uh, five chapters to my presentation today. We're, first, I'm going to convince you of the impact of storytelling. And then we're going to go into a segue into uh, what, what is a brand, and then to personal branding and storytelling, and then how to fuse those as a professional online and offline. And like I said, my, my book is a, a good reference um, for crafting your story in the end. A little volume here, but. So uh, can you all hear me, by the way? This, in fact, is not a microphone. I'm all hooked up with um, <laughs> things uh, for videotaping. But can you all hear me OK? All right. Otherwise, you can go further. OK. Well, once upon a time, il était une fois in Switzerland, what do you say? 
for once upon a time. Oh yeah, es war einmal. Yeah, I know a little bit of German. Uh, es war einmal. So do those words um, conjure up memories, maybe of your favorite story as a child? Might have been a fairy tale. There might have been a villain, a prince, a princess. In fact, what was your favorite story as a child growing up? Because I can see you all are going back a few years <laughs> and you're all smiling and you're thinking oh. what was what was your favorite I'm thinking I can't really remember one not the favorite one yeah anyone want to share their favorite childhood story or just the name of it yes the snow queen oh the snow queen okay anyone else Nothing comes to mind. Yeah, or, or your children's favorite story? Probably, maybe. Okay. Little Red Riding Hood. Aha. Capuchon. <laughs> oh, good. Well, uh, my favorite story actually um, growing up was um, the stories about this fairy, this leprechaun. I'm of Irish descent, and um, there were stories about this little wee we uh, leprechaun who appeared on St. Patrick's Day, it was March 17th. And this little leprechaun was quite mischievous. You um, would play all kinds of tricks. In fact, growing up, or waking up in the morning on, on March 17th, the milk would be green, there would be gold dust sprinkled everywhere. My mom, who had never even been to Ireland, though her parents were born there, would take on this Irish accent. I mean, just crazy things happened on St. Patrick's Day. And this little, this character, we never saw him. My brothers and sisters and I would, you know, try and find him. We'd find traces of the leprechaun. But um, I never found him. However, if you did catch the leprechaun, he, in order to um, set him free, he would grant you three wishes. So you would not believe the amount of time that I spent with my siblings thinking, oh, what would those three wishes be if we ever found this? Leprechaun, this fairy. That, so that was one of my favorites. Well, stories aren't new. Um, I mean, in fact, every culture has their master storyteller. The European troubadour, the Native American shaman, the, um, the Gaelic bard. And they're, they're master storytellers. They're not talking about facts and, and figures. So stories aren't new. In fact, anthropologists feel that 70% of what we learn is through stories. Yeah. So what is um, what is new is that, and, and stories, by the way, play across you know a host of settings in song, in dance. I mean, just today you've probably told a number of stories around the water cooler, up uh, during lunch, at networking events. You're telling stories all the time in mime. So as I said, stories aren't new. In fact, when you think about it, our you know, ancestors sitting around the campfire, eating berries, telling stories about you know, why coyotes howl at night, why snakes don't have legs, why volcanoes erupt. These are all stories that e explain these um, situations. So they're not new. But what is new is um, recent neurological evidence and that uh, validates the speculation that stories have impact. Well, these nuggets of um, information are uh, conducted through fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. They've actually identified that our brains are hardwired to absorb information in story format. Why? Because through storytelling, it connects the left, the logical, rational side of the brain to the right, the emotional and the feeling part of the brain. So it connects uh, the subconscious and the unconscious. And this all happens through storytelling. So it's really a very natural process in terms of absorbing information in narrative form. We easily digest that. So that's one nugget of um, scientific evidence. Um, they've also identified that story learning increases memory retention sevenfold. And they've also identified, uh, you know, there's a host of other um, examples as well, but just one more nugget, is um, that they've identified that like the, the first five most often uttered words 
for children across all nationalities. As you may imagine, the first and second ones are usually, you know, mama, papa. But in the top five is the word story. So that's why on the cover of my book, I actually um, have the word story in various languages. Well, what is this, um, this uh, scientific evidence triggered? Why an actual movement, a storytelling movement, and there's people like me running around, storytelling evangelists, uh, talking about the impact of storytelling. And it's played out across different levels. Um, in higher education, there's more than 40 universities that offer storytelling courses. I, I give courses um, and, and workshops at um, INSEAD, IMD, EDEC, I should say, on storytelling. And there's blogs and forums and conventions and all, all kinds of um, uh, events around storytelling and books. Well, here's one in front of you <laughs> that you already have, actually. Uh, at a different level, at the corporate level, why uh, some of the top corporations intentionally uh, encourage the art of storytelling. For example, 3M, you've heard of 3M, of Post-it fame, right? They've actually banned the use of bullet points in their presentations in favor of, you know, telling stories, strategic narratives. Uh, Procter & Gamble, why they bring in directors from Hollywood to coach their C-level executives on telling stories. And I'd, I'd read about this, right, but in a presentation I just had last week in Geneva, uh, one of the participants was from Procter & Gamble, and she was saying yes. I mean, she was, she um, was involved in a, a course on uh, storytelling. What's another uh, corporation? Um, Motorola. They uh, send their you know, executives on uh, courses around impromptu, improvisation, and storytelling. So it really is an art, and it's become a leadership skill. So it's an art that can be developed. Also at the um, primary education level, the way, sorry about that, uh, child psychologists who study the effects of fairy tales on children actually encourage uh, parents and teachers to nurture the art of developing uh, narr narratives amongst children. In fact, I love this quote by Einstein where he said, um, if you want your children to be intelligent, <coughs> read them stories, read them fairy tales. If you want your children to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. <laughs> so I like that idea. So across different levels, you know, the art of uh, the impact of storytelling is being realized and developed. But what, um, here's a, you know, what is the definition of a story? Here's, here's one definition, a narrative, tale, or recounting of a sequence of real or fictitious events. There's various definitions, but it, in my opinion, a, at the very you know, basic level, a story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And of course there's boring stories, lackluster stories. You know, what makes for a good story? You wouldn't want to volunteer? Yes. Some element of identification with okay. some characters usually. All right, you identify with the, some of the characters in the, okay. And you have a big villain usually. <laughs> <laughs> what was your Sorry. favorite big villain? Well, I like Sauron and all the villains. Zorro? Zorro? Okay. All these characters. Okay. Anyone else? And then some element that makes your eyebrows go up. People are like, ooh, how can that be? Uh huh. <laughs> Suspense. 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 Okay, I like the eyebrow <laughs> idea. <laughs> Excitement. Excitement, okay. <clears throat> well, I think you're all right. And, you know, a good story is one that grabs you at the beginning, keeps you engaged, and then there's some kind of defining moment. Don't you hate it when you're all set up for a story and then there's no end? You're just like left there? <laughs> but what makes for those fabulous stories that are memorable? Well, those are the ones that trigger the senses and touch the emotions. And what could those emotions be? Fear, hate, love, suspense? 
So those are the ones that are really memorable. Oh, we all have our, our favorite fairy tales. Well, before um, I turn the chapter, turn the page to the next chapter about uh, what, what is a brand, I wanted to just um, tell you about my aha moment when I discovered the impact of storytelling. I don't know if any of you have been to the Canadian Rockies, but this, yes? Oh, okay. So this is, um, it's, yeah, it's near, near that area. So it was on the way to the Athabasca Parkway. Uh, so I had a, a stint of being a tour director for about actually seven years. And um, the, with a very high-end company. And so as a tour director, in terms of the training, we trained with uh, two other tour directors where we sat in the coach and took notes. Well, this was the first day of the tour and we we're going down this highway. Look at that scenery and it was amazing. And we were gonna be stepping onto a glacier that, at the end of the day. Well, the tour director, he was going on and on about the glacial precipitation, uh, you know, the retreat of the foot of the glacier, the, you know, the statistics about the flora and the fauna and you know, the geology and everything. I looked around on the coach, about 40 people on the coach, and they were sleeping. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Some of them were polite enough to put on sunglasses, you know, so, but you know, then they had their mouths open. <laughs> and their mouths weren't open because of the beautiful scenery, because they were in awe, uh, but you know, they were catching flies and snoring. So I looked around and I thought, when I have that microphone and I'm in front of the coach talking to my groups, no one is gonna fall asleep. Because they're taking expensive naps, the first part. And they're missing all this great scenery. And so how did I get around that? By telling them stories. And I talked about um, the Native Americans, about the trappers, about the climbers, because a lot of these peaks actually, believe it or not, were named after Swiss alpine guides. Why? Because the Canadians kept on falling off the mountains, so they called on the Swiss Alpine guides <laughs> to show them how to uh, climb these, these peaks. And so they named a lot of the peaks after the uh, Swiss climbers. So, uh, so I wove stories, and yes, you know, the guests and the clients on my tours, they learned about the flora and the fauna and the glacial retreat and all that, but it's all weaved around stories. So that was my aha moment. So I, I pretty much became a professional storyteller uh, throughout uh, for about a seven-year period. So before I just, um, I found, you know, I, I'm on a, I have my Google alert set to, you know, storytelling, um, artificial intelligence, things like that, neurological research around storytelling. So I just, before I, we go to the next chapter, um, this came up recently. It was a quote from an, an artificial intelligence guru, a visionary guru called Roger um, Shank, and he was talking about the progress in artificial intelligence, and he was saying that it's held back because of um, the computer's inability to understand narratives. So true artificial intelligence can only be possible when machines or um, computers can tell and understand stories. So I just thought that was interesting. Okay. So the next uh, chapter, you ready? Have I convinced you of the impact and the power of storytelling? Okay, good. <laughs> Actually, one of the um, psychologists that I interview in my book, she, was, she gives presentations um, all over the world and she noticed over time, she didn't realize it right away, but she noticed that when she would just mention the word story um, in her presentation, physically she could see people kind of perk up. Mm -hmm. So even the word, uh, and actually, I noticed that when I started my presentation, I asked you all to think about your favorite childhood story. I, you definitely all changed your visually. <laughs> it was very nice to see you were all relaxed and like thinking back. Uh, so the next chapter is about um, you know identify what what is a brand. We'll dive deeper into personal branding, and then fuse how you as a professional can fuse personal branding and storytelling. So there's various definitions of what is a brand. The Marketing Association has one that's about, you know, 200 words. But this is my definition of what is a brand. So it's an intangible, you can't touch it, image or perception created by a unique bundle or accumulation of emotional, rational, and sensory experiences. 
and stories. And this all makes sense in a little bit. But just out of curiosity, what are some of your favorite brands? It can be across any category. Apple. Apple? Okay, well, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> I even saved the packaging when I, you know, I mean, it's just <laughs> impressive. Patagonia. Patagonia? Okay. I'm sure you, yes? Tesla. Okay. Anyone else? Well, think about why those are your favorite brands. And for each person, it's unique. So it's, an Im it's, it's something that's intangible. But uh, you're uh, all financial analysts, yes? <laughs> uh, sometimes the, when there's a merger and acquisition, the actual price tag they put on this image or perception of the brand is more than the physical assets. So it's quite amazing there's different formulas to figure that out. Maybe some of you even are involved in something of that nature. But, um, and you know, it's, it's worth, it has a financial value to it. So it's interesting to identify what could, what makes this image your perception. And what could be a brand? Why, oh, the Eiffel Tower is a brand. The CFA is a brand. Madonna's a brand. Your brand. Okay, Nike. Starbucks. But what makes you know, a simple cup of coffee into this experience? Well, Starbucks, for example. Well, the stimulation of senses. I mean, you walk into a Starbucks. I actually, like I said, I grew up in Los Angeles, but I moved to Europe about 12 years ago from Seattle, home of Starbucks. I'm not a great Starbucks fan. But it is pretty amazing how they you know, touch all the senses. You walk into a Starbucks cafe, there's the smell, there's the sight. There's the taste of the coffee, there's the music, you know, everything's orchestrated, the way the, way the baristas greet you, okay? So you, it's this, you know, all these experiences or touch points that you have with um, the brand create this image. So these are some of the top brands that uh, I'm sure you all recognize. And think of the touch points that you have with these brands. And also the use of stories. Stories behind the founders, or the, the stories that they use in their advertising. In fact, I know with American Express, after I did my MBA, I was hired by American Express in London, in their Traveler's Check division. And at the time, they were running these ads about um, the, the frantic, the, the tourists, you know, lost her Traveler's Checks in some remote country. But, aha, they were American Express Traveler's Checks, so they were refunded right away. And you know, you really felt. I mean, you had that emotional contact with that that person. They, they were you know, the campaign, the commercials actually touched your emotions. So that was you know much more effective than identifying you know how many currencies American Express travelers checks come in or how many places they can be refunded. So the use of stories is captivating and engaging and more memorable. So what makes for a strong brand? I call it, I, I, I boil it down to four C's in storytelling, of course. And this will apply to your personal brand as well. But a strong brand, brand is clear in their target, who their target is. Okay. Is you know, Volvo uh, targeting teenagers? No, they're very clear in, in their messaging. They're very clear on who their target is. In terms of coverage, across various platforms, you know, not just billboards, not just signage, not just in a magazine ad. And consistency, in terms of consistent uh, touch points and experiences. So you go into you know, one Starbucks, for example, and you're expecting a Starbucks in another country to be consistent. Or say, for example, you bank with a particular bank and their ads say Societe Generale, uh, their ads say, oh, you know, the tellers are friendly. You go into, <laughs> you go into a, um, a Societe Generale, you won't have to wait very long in line. So you have these ex expectations. You go into the branch. The teller is in a bad mood. You waited 20 minutes. So inconsistent touch points. Strong brands are consistent across all touch points. And constancy. They're, Strong brands are constantly in front of their target. In fact, they did a study um, in the States where they identified, on the average, how many times the average American sees the 
brand or has a touch point with the brand Coca-Cola, which could be you know someone mentioning the word, drinking it, you know, saying. Have any guesses on how many times on the average per day an American has a touch point? Five times. <laughs> Five. Okay. Good guess. Four. Four. Hundred. Seventeen. Uh, yeah. So strong brands are constantly in front of their target. And stories. So how do uh, brands use stories? So let me, I just want to bring back this um, definition again because it might start to make more sense in terms of all of these touch points. But how do um, brands use stories? And there is a prize for this slide. And the prize is um, a signed copy of my book <laughs> with a bookmark. <laughs> for the person who can guess the story behind this picture. It's how they invented the waffling from souls. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, can you elaborate? They probably ruined a few waffle items. So yes, OK. You are, spot are you from uh, Oregon? No. Okay. <laughs> where, where did you hear the story? Or are you just guessing? I, I guessed. Oh. I totally guessed. I mean, it just said, that's the story that that picture told. Okay. Because I've had, you know, different, like, wild guesses, but that was maybe the first time it's happened like that, <laughs> where you hadn't heard the story before. But you're exactly right. Uh, so um, Bill Bowerman, one of the founders of Nike, this was in the 70s, and um, he was experimenting with uh, creating a sole for running shoes that would grab the tarmac. And so it was Sunday morning, looked at the waffle iron and thought, aha, let's experiment. So he actually poured urethane into the waffle iron and stuck it on the bottom of a pair of running shoes. And that was the launch, the beginning of um, the waffle trainer in the 70s. So stories like that are repeated, memorable, but stories are, are captivating. And so brands, product and service brands, you know, the, the companies, the, the brands that you work for, you know, they use stories. Subway, for example, you know, they run these ad campaigns where, you know, the, the portly gentleman who eats at uh, Subway for a period of six months or so, all, all of a sudden is slim. So there's, you know, stories that are used in advertising. Um, you know, nonprofits use stories as well. Anyone familiar with Kiva? Okay, well, they're um, a organization. They're based in San Francisco, and um, they provide microfinance loans to entrepreneurs in devel developing countries. And in fact, proceeds, partial proceeds from my book, go to Kiva. And their logo is on the back. And I talk about Kiva in my book. But the reason why I love Kiva is because, um, well, not only what they do in terms of providing microfinance loans, but the fact that their website is full, chock full of stories. Because you can actually read the stories of the various entrepreneurs who might need, you know, one or two thousand dollars and what they're using it for. You can read about their, their story. Uh, in terms of financing, it's increments, increments of twenty-five dollars. But so you're you're loaning to these entrepreneurs with other people and you can find out the stories on the other people that you're it's in this group. So it's just um, to show you that uh, you know, nonprofits as well use stories. All right, ready for the next chapter of the book and of the presentation. And this is about personal branding. So we're diving deeper, getting closer to how you're going to fuse your personal brand with storytelling. Well, how did this whole concept of personal branding start? Well. It was in 1997, actually, when um, an article was written by Tom Peters in Fast Company Magazine. It's still one of my favorite magazines. And uh, the actual article was called, The Brand Called You. And this triggered the personal branding movement, which um, was actually just the idea of taking the same tools and methodologies that are used with your favorite brands, which some of you talked about, and applying them to people. So that's the whole idea of uh, personal branding, and it was you know, triggered by this um, uh, by this uh, 
article. And it made perfect sense to me. I had worked about 15 years in marketing and branding for Fortune 500 companies, Procter & Gamble, DHL, such on the advertising, you know, an agency on the agency and client side, such and Sachi, for example. So this whole idea of uh, using the same tools and methodologies with people really resonated with me. So that's when I made uh, a you know, gradual transition to personal branding. And believe me, I find it much more satisfying with, um, you know, instead of working with disposable diapers and traveler's checks, <laughs> now I get to work with people brands and help them identify what makes them unique. So what is personal branding? Well, it's the whole idea and process of identifying, clarifying, and communicating what makes you unique. So what could possibly be those touch points or experiences that people have with the brand called you that create that image or perception? Okay, so we you know, talked about product and service brands and <clears throat> different uh, experiences or touch points that create that image or perception. But what about for the brand called you? What could some of those touch points be? Someone likes you. OK. Every interaction you have with people every day is actually creating your brand. I mean, I know there's also LinkedIn, et cetera. Uh -huh. Every time you open your mouth, every time you write an email, you're presenting something about yourself to the outside world. Exactly. Those are all touch points. I mean, it could be something as as basic as um, the message that you leave on your telephone. You know, that's a touch point. Uh, but exactly what, how you present yourself, you know, what you look like, what you're wearing, uh, the car you drive, all of these, and there are hundreds, you know, it could be thousands of different experiences or touch points that create this image or perception, and it's all different for different people. And of course, Ladies, it's always the shoes, right? <laughs> uh, so yes, so it, you're exactly right. It's your LinkedIn profile. It's uh, what's out there on Facebook. It's the car you drive. It's the computer. It's you know all of these different touch points or experiences create this image or perception about the brand called you. But what's the difference between just just the perception, which is? where there is a multitude of different uh, ways uh, and things that you get, uh, that you get across and, and uh, the pieces that make the brand because uh, obviously that's got to be simple and condensed down and repeated and, and stuff so uh, well I guess yeah <laughs> what? so what was the question or is it a comment what makes the difference between those tons of different things that you do and say and, and, and communicate every day uh, and, and, and what really makes the, that condensate uh, that needs to be a brand. I mean, the, the double arches, the golden arches of McDonald's and the Apple thing, that, that's, that's a brand, but we don't have that, right? So how do I improve it, my personal brand? Great, okay, good. We're getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so, you have all these different touch points and experiences that you have with other brands and that people have with, with your brand that create this image or perception. And a really great way to communicate your personal brand once you've um, you know, identified in your target, for example, and clarified what makes you unique, which is a process. It's not, um, in, in the book it can, I out outline the process that I take clients through, but it's um, a process process in identifying that and developing it. But a great way to communicate your personal brand is through storytelling. And I've already convinced you about the impact of storytelling. So where are you telling your story? In offline and online situations. In offline situations, you're telling your story oftentimes in the interview. So how many of you have interviewed people? Okay, and I think we've all, all been on the other side of the table, right? <laughs> so in interviewing people, aren't you just like begging for really good stories? 
that are going to convince you that this candidate is the ideal person for the job. And you know those behavioral questions. In fact, in my book, I have like the, the top ten behavioral questions that are just begging for stories. And if you're on the other side of the table, why you want to have some good stories ready to tell, right? That are going to convince the person or the hiring manager uh, that you're the right one for the job. So, what are those stories that you're going to tell? How do you find them? How do you develop them? Another place where you're telling your story offline is. Oh, by the way, this is my favorite <laughs> um, image. It's the chameleon. Why? Because you're changing your story all the time, depending on the situation, who you're talking to. And I don't mean changing your story in terms of spin, or you know, you're not Pinocchio, where you're going to be <laughs> telling s stories. Uh, your nose gets longer and longer. Uh, you don't want to be Pinocchio, but you do want to adapt your story to the, who, who you're speaking to. And what are the stories that are going to resonate with that particular person? The elevator pitch. Have you heard of that expression, right? Or your 60 second commercial. So these are some uh, elevator doors from a, not which building it is in New York. But um, anyways, it's the whole idea where you arrive in the elevator, the doors open, you walk inside. Who is inside the elevator? But the person that you want to impress professionally, we're talking about. And it could be you know, the CEO of the company that you want to work for. It could be that prospect that you've been looking, you know, searching for uh, you know, to set up a meeting. It, um, so the, you get in the elevator, you're going up to about you know, the 100th floor, so about 60 seconds or so. The doors close. What are you going to say? <laughs> so that's the idea. So it's your short version of your story, right? Um, I'm not saying that anyone got a job in an elevator. <laughs> but um, it's the, you know, the high, whole idea of you know, condensing and in short 60 seconds identifying what you're going to say, your short high level story. And in fact, I, I run a lot of, you've probably heard of speed dating. Yeah. Well, I do a lot of speed networking events, which are really fun. I kind of uh, launched the event with talking about um, the elevator pitch, what to say. And then throughout the course of the evening, everyone gives their elevator pitch maybe 10 times to various people. So it gets a lot of practice. And they're timed, right? After 60 seconds, the bell goes off and you have to wrap it up. So that's where you're, uh, uh, an offline situation where you're telling your story. What about in online situations? Where are you telling your story? LinkedIn, we'll get to that part, it's the summary area just to give you a little indication where you can tell your story. Uh, on Facebook, uh, does the CFA, do they have like a, a, a site where you can post your profile and your story or your bio? Do they, I mean as a member, or maybe you're a um, <clears throat> member of an alumni association where I know I put my Thunderbird is my <coughs> alumni association so I put the logo up there. So. For our alumni association, we can post a picture, you know, a bio. By the way, how many of you have a version of your bio or professional story that you've written or used in the past? Okay, so, and um, just out of curiosity, where, what was the situation where you used your professional bio? Yeah. Uh, for an article that was published and they needed the bio. Okay. Or also for speaking events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know as an author, I have maybe ooh, 10 different versions of my bio, the short one, the long one, you know, depending on the placement. Okay, and was it um, written in the third person? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so normally speaking, professional bios are written in the third person, so it's as if someone's talking about you. But actually, there's a show of hands here. Uh, what were the occasions where you used your bio? Mm, it was fairly similar to what was mentioned. I mean, like uh, writing uh, articles in newspapers. Okay. Or just uh, a short uh, presentation as a speaker. Okay. Yeah. And also, they, 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 they come up with uh, websites. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Who we are. Then you have like, a couple of names, picture, bio, people have a claim, what they stand for, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of you have a, some type of version of your bio that. Um, was written or adapted to the target, the placement, and the usage. Amazon, have any of you written a, um, a book review on Amazon? 
Because if you're looking for a Google juice, <laughs> uh, writing a, a, a um, review on Amazon is great for your Google results and for your Google juice. Why? Because, um, well, it's because of the, um, it's, it's an often searched site. But also, when you write a review, you can post your picture, you can post your bio, and it really um, increases your Google, Google, Google juice. <laughs> In fact, um, the first uh, review that I wrote was some years ago on a book called The Banker to the Poor by Muhammad Yunus. And so I, I wrote it, and it still pops up, and this was a number of years ago. When I Google myself, it still pops up on the first page. So you might want to think, you know, these are just little tips of how to increase your um, Google juice. And but anyways, so these are other areas where you're telling your story online. And also in terms of your story that you've already, some of you have already created um, a version of your bio. In my book, I, I talk about maybe 10 or 15 different ways of using your bio. For example, for investment, uh, for uh, business plans, I know for you know presentations to investors, you know they want to know about the founders. So I work with you know startups and helping write their stories. Uh, as authors on LinkedIn, that summary area. So there's all kinds of uh, places where you can tell your story online. So some people say, well, if you don't show up in Google, you don't exist. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that everyone has to be visible on Google, or I'm not saying that you all have to be on LinkedIn. But if your target is going to be looking for you on the web, then you, know, then you want to be visible. And as you uh, realized, most of you, if you had the time to Google yourself, which is something I highly recommend that you do on a regular basis, if um, you did Google yourself and you're on LinkedIn, I'm pretty sure your LinkedIn profile came either one first or second result, or for sure on the first, on the first page. And you may have you know, other entries. I think some of you mentioned you know, if you've been published, there might be something about that, or a presentation, or an article. You know, those results will appear as well. But because you know, there's 20, 80 million people that are familiar with LinkedIn, they're going to go there and expect to find you know, some information about you. What's the first thing that's going to have an impact when um, you go onto a LinkedIn profile? Picture. Yes. <laughs> so that, if you think of it, your picture could be the first experience or touch point that someone has with your brand. So you're all thinking about what your picture looks like? <laughs> I, I mean, you can't help but make uh, you know, some kind of assessment or, or judgment um, when you see the, the, the picture. So you want it to be professional, you know, looking inwards. And in my book, I talk about the photo and give you some tips on what to um, what it should be, the, the face should actually take up about 80% of the frame. So LinkedIn is really your professional window to the world. And, so you, and there's a great place in the summary area to write your story, which is where you have about 2,000 characters. And I looked at some of your LinkedIn profiles. Um, <laughs> And if we have time, I can, we can look at some of them in more, or bring them up on the screen. Um, but in that summary area is where you have 2,000 characters, including spaces, <coughs> to tell your story. And so the, lots of times, because the first thing I do with um, clients or in my workshops, you know, I have people Google themselves. If their LinkedIn profile comes up first, then we directly address that. And so that summary area is a place where you can message your story. Written in the third person is usually uh, how bios are, are written. But it's not the place, by the way, and I saw this, where you, I can see you cut and pasted the top of your resume, you know, where you have like a little profile. I, I saw a lot of that, or bullet points, or, you know, you, that's a place where you can tell your story. But you want to make it a good story, captivating, engaging and you know, write it so it has a good structure and flow, but it has to be written to your target. So what are the stories that uh, you might develop? Well, they could be stories around your emotional intelligence skills, your leadership skills. If you happen to be you know, transitioning from one industry to the other, you want to bring forward 
in, in stories or make reference to um, the transferable skills, the leadership skills. I had one client who was uh, transferring from, or transitioning from the tobacco industry, and he had you know, C level positions globally in the tobacco industry, but he wanted to get out of the tobacco industry, and he ended up uh, transitioning into the luxury industry. And primarily, we messaged in his messaging, in his story, uh, his transferable skills around his leadership skills. So your resume, the bio is not your resume, um, because your resume, as you know, is chronological. Well, the bio is written, doesn't have to be chronological at all, it's written more to your direction. And besides, there's word out there, and this may be, uh, you may have hear this today for the first time, but they say that the resume, ready for this, is dead. <laughs> Why? Because um, people are going online to find people. In fact, these are some recent statistics uh, around um, how recruiters and headhunters are using LinkedIn or the internet. So um, 80, 89%, this is from a Jobvite study, will recruit through social media. 90% of HR professionals Google people before meeting them. 70% of um, in, employees were rejected uh, based on their online information. And 85% said that positive online reputation influenced uh, their decisions. <coughs> so like I said, that first um, touch point may be your LinkedIn profile. So in my book, and like I said, I sent you all the ebook, so um, because you know, this presentation today is only an hour, or uh, might even be going over an hour. So it's, uh, you know, not, you're not gonna walk away with, um, you know, a clear idea of how to write your, your bio, but in my book there's different sections that help you kind of trigger the inspiring questions that help you trigger the stories that um, you can develop. But the um, idea is to first, you know, discover those stories and in working with clients it's an, an interview process but those can, those stories are behind those bullet points in your resume okay and also in the book there's different tools that um, I use in fact I have an accompanying workbook that goes with the book so there's different tools that can help you develop those stories and then you want to document them write them down and then distribute them online and offline <coughs> One of the tools that is really a foundation tool for uh, my process, I call it the visibility branding storytelling tool. It's quite basic, but it's actually where you, you know, identify the situation, the challenge, the action, the results, were there any testimonials. So in my workshops, um, we you know, get more into, into this, but I suggest that you all have at least three to five really great stories in your back pocket that can be used and adapted to you know, various situations that can answer some of those top interview questions or when you're presenting yourself to clients. So this is a foundation tool that you can um, read about in the, the book. And um, like I said, I run whole courses on, on this. There's some other tools in the book um, around your leadership and emotional intelligence skills. So I network a lot with headhunters, recruiters, HR professionals, and um, they're calling your EQ skills, your emotional intelligence skills, they call that the new yardstick. That's how they're judging and evaluating candidates is through their emotional intelligence skills and leadership skills. And are those really found or messaged on your resume? Not exactly, okay, a few bullet points here and there. But it's actually through stories that you can message those. But good stories, you know, good structure, flow, that's the challenge. So there's different tools that I use. Um, I use a lot of pie charts, and I just thought I'd throw up my favorite pie, which is lemon meringue. <laughs> I know, we're probably all getting hungry. Uh, but the, the tool actually is basically where you, uh, for leadership skills, for example, uh, I talk about you know, six different areas of leadership, and you read about these different areas, and then you uh, divide up the pie, in slices according to where you feel you're strongest. Now the ideal leader 
if that person actually exists, would be strong in all six areas. But we all, you know, are stronger. Uh, we have um, different areas of specialty. So you identify, you cut up the lemon meringue pie. <laughs> And so you have you know, the biggest slice that could be around vision and values or you know, developing people. And so then the next step is, well, you identify that big section. What are the stories behind that? So these are just different tools that can help you identify the stories and lead you to writing them down. There's another tool in the book um, on the elevator pitch. And again, you're constantly changing your story based on your target and the placement. So what I recommend in your career toolkit is um, a few things. Resume, okay, some people say it's dead, but you know it's a recognized document. You want to have your resume in there. Uh, I suggest business cards. I know some of you forgot them today, but <laughs> that should be in your toolkit. Recommendations, a good professional photo, and I recommend three different versions of your bio. So the short Twitter version, you know, 140 characters or so, which actually can be used uh, <laughs> in, under in your, on your LinkedIn profile, just next to your photo. It, by default, they'll grab the title of your, your current title. But in fact, that's an area where you can tell your little you know, short story, which can be keywords, by the way. It doesn't have to be a phrase. It can be just like keywords. So that um, would be the short version. And then the medium version, which is, I don't know, around 200 words or so, because for a lot of you who already have a bio, maybe requested for a publication or for a speaking engagement, when you ask, and when they say, oh, can you send in your bio? And then you might ask, well, how long? And they usually will say, oh, 150, 200 words. So, you know, a little paragraph. So I recommend having that version in your bio, in your toolkit, in your career toolkit. And then the other version is the longer version that could be appropriate for LinkedIn, where you can actually develop some stories and tell a little bit more about you know, your key skills and at attributes, but in a narrative format. So um, before, how are we doing for time, by the way? OK, it's 1.10. How, how does that, it's some Q&A or? Well, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, we've got another couple of minutes until uh, quarter past, uh, I'd say, and then uh, we'll wrap up. OK. Uh, so. Yeah. Quick question. You, one of the comments you said is consistency, and always have consistency. At the same time, you showed us a chameleon that showed you know, variability. Uh -huh. So how do you? Uh, resolve that with both consistency and flexibility. Okay. Okay, by consistency as it applies to your personal brand, in terms of being consistent across touch points, it means that your LinkedIn profile is has is professional. You know, there's no typos, good flow, good structure. Uh, your photo is consistent at the same level. Your interviewing skills, your presentation skills. So that's what I mean by consistent touch points. Um, you know, sometimes I'll look at someone's resume and, you know, it'll shine. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> and then I'll look at their LinkedIn profile, it's like, ugh, you know. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, their LinkedIn profile oftentimes will be seen first uh, before the resume. So, I mean, just out of curiosity, how much time have um, you spent on your LinkedIn profile? on your professional image to the world that everyone is seeing when they're Googling you. How, yes, how long? Are you on LinkedIn? Uh, I erased it actually, I, have, uh, I used to have one. Oh, uh, so you're not on LinkedIn? No. Okay, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not saying everyone has to be on LinkedIn. But, uh, no, when I did it, I spent a couple of hours, I guess. Okay, okay. a couple hours. Sorry. All right, 15 minutes, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, right. Okay. Well, think about you know how much time you took getting ready for the day. I mean, 15 minutes on your professional image to the world. Uh, you might want to take a, another look at it. <laughs> <laughs> or you know how much time have you spent on your resume? I mean, over time. You know, hours and hours, I'm sure. 
Uh, but like I said, the resume could be dead. That's not what people are saying first. So you might want to um, look at what's on your LinkedIn profile and using stories. Yes. Uh, I've got one question. I, I mean, I get the, the importance of the narrative and uh, how, how important storytelling is. And you mentioned that uh, you should adapt the story uh, to your target, to the to the other end, to the uh, counterpart of your target. Right. However, how does that uh, match with the branding? Uh, how does uh, how does that gel with the brand? Because in my mind, uh, a brand actually is a compensation. Is a very simple. Uh, write down or something that's recognizable and re repeatable easily uh, but, but that doesn't quite in my mind that doesn't quite gel with uh, what you said about uh, adapting it and, and having it uh, having it changing over mm -hmm. time okay well the very first part of the process is um, identifying your target so for example on LinkedIn you know your target is quite broad so you have to identify what your, who, who your target is and what are the personal brand attributes that are going to resonate with that target. And clarifying those and message, messaging and communicating those. So that's um, to address the chameleon. <laughs> uh, you ad adapt according to you know, the situation. Your, your bio, by the way, your story, um, evolves over time. So it's basically you know, where the placement is, the target, and the usage. <coughs> and like I said, this is a very short presentation, but a lot of this is developed more in my book, which um, hopefully will be kind of a launch to get you jump-started to writing your story. And oh, by the way, remember the leprechaun and the three wishes that you could have if you caught the leprechaun? Well, I actually just remembered what or thought of what my three wishes might be. The first wish would be that I had more wishes. <laughs> uh, the second wish is that I can come back to Switzerland. I love getting out of Paris and beautiful mountains and the lakes and everything. And then the third wish would be that we all develop the art of storytelling because your children, grandchildren, friends, colleagues, they will all appreciate it. And if we all develop the art of storytelling, we'll all live happily ever <laughs> after. <laughs> yes? Uh, one question. I mean, uh, isn't that also dangerous that you recommend everyone to tell a story? I mean, there are people that are just not capable of like storytelling. If they try to tell a story, it can get very... Yeah, everyone thinks everyone can tell a story, but that's just not the truth. Some people, they're capable of some things and other things they're not capable. Why should everyone be able to tell a good story about uh, where he stands and what he is and what he wants to present uh, for the world? I mean, it's like it's telling everyone, yeah, hey, just be non-linear met mathematicians. And that's also not something that is uh, attainable for everybody. So mm -hmm. No, I agree with you, you that you know, there's... And, and if, if now everyone goes out and just starts uh, writing a story, hey, I heard I have to write a story about me and myself on LinkedIn, and now I write this story. And this can be, I mean, it can go wrong. Right. And I've, I've seen really bad stories. <laughs> uh, so, right, so it is an art that can be developed. So it has to have good structure, flow, the content has to resonate with your target. It's not something that uh, is, you can do in you know, a, few, a few minutes. So it, it really is an art and a structure that needs to be developed. And uh, that's what I help people do, is tell a good, a good story. And it doesn't matter, um, I mean, I, I'm a wordsmith, I, I love writing. It, you know, with my clients who come from all different, or from different nationalities and cultures, it doesn't always mean that the you know, native English speakers are the best writers. Because it really is more the flow and the content that people have problems with in identifying how to tell a good story. Yeah. It's, it's, maybe, it's maybe worth knowing that uh, Holly Harry is one of our uh, journalists. Oh. Uh, Talked to all the colleagues and he's uh, received a prize also recently for uh, well, some, uh, some stories as well. Okay. <laughs> stories. Uh, well, I think this is a good time to basically uh, wrap up uh, the presentation. You're certainly around as well for yes. the lunch yes. and uh, available to ask uh, questions about your individual stories uh, at a personal uh, level. So uh, let's give Bernadette a hand. Thank you.
I would just like to... Uh...